Hi everyone and welcome to Plural Spark Tank. We have an extremely interesting topic to cover with you today. Let me introduce you to our speakers. Our first speaker is Aprajit. He heads the venture capital arm at Veranium, a portfolio management company, and he has multiple years of experience in investment banking, investor relations, and startup investments. And we have Anu. He is a partner at Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas. He co-heads the fintech arm and is widely regarded as the industry expert in regulatory compliances. Welcome Aprajit and Anu to Plural Spark Tank. As I mentioned in the beginning of the episode, I think this is one of the most important and interesting conversations in the area that we operate in, which is regulatory compliance. And I know that you have recently rolled out and co-authored a report which actually talks about all regulatory compliances within fintech across multiple areas, whether it's investments, insurance, payments, lending, and allied activities. So why don't we start off with maybe you telling us a little bit about the report, uh, what it covers, and some of the most interesting insights for, for us to look at. So the genesis of the report was that, you know, we've been finding that many startup founders criticize the regulator for, you know, uh, keeping changing laws, but the fact is that the laws have been in place for a long time and many a times founders are actually not aware of it because there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of RBI circulars, lots of regulation which is already in place. So we thought we'd create a compendium which sort of encompasses the whole thing which is relevant from FinTech. Both Anu and I discussed this probably in June last year and this was published in uh, Jan 2024, uh, which basically covers not just the Indian landscape, but also covers what's how do we how we compare with uh, global uh, jurisdictions like Singapore, EU, or US. So we've yeah. covered that part as well as some of the recent regulations which have come out in uh, not just fintech, but also in, you know the newer technologies which are coming in for AI, deep fake or, you know, just the regulations on shopping, etc., where there is basket snatching and stuff like that, which is there. Uh, how does, first of all, someone get access to this report? Is this available? This is freely available it on our freely website. Available. Start charging for it, no? You should charge. I was going to say that. It's the it's the time to monetize everything. <laughs> but no. no. Lighter. But, you know, we actually realize there's a gap globally. Uh, the, the topic you have here, there is no one size. You talk about property, you talk about capital markets, you talk about m and you'll still find, you know where to go. Here, world over, there is no one treatise where anybody can look at. So, uh, and very often, uh, Prajit as an investor, me as an advisor, we see that there's a Bible that was lacking for founders, investors, practitioners. So anybody who's looking at entering this space, if they just spend a weekend going through this, they can probably avoid a lot of the mistakes in business modeling. So tell us a little bit maybe Anu about one maybe interesting insights that you also gathered while this report was created by and co-authored by the both of you and something which maybe uh, we could also take back as potential founders, investors and people working in these firms. But one thing particularly I learned because on the back of the learning from this I went back spoke to my managing partner and we launched a book on payments, the payments book uh, a few months ago. Because I I, we, I realized the dots in this sector are too many. Yeah. Probably for any, and you know, the way the business is evolving, and then Prajit can uh, tell me if I've got this right, there is no one business model. Nobody can ever be in payments or in lending or in P2P or in wealth tech or in insure tech. This is nothing but what a bank does effectively or a bank can do. We call it Section 6 of Banking Regulation Act, but a bank is allowed to do, which has got two, three pages of law. Yeah. And people are picking a part of it, trying to do it through a wrapper model. So the way the dots are connected is very is fascinating. Uh, and if you take a 10-year journey of any, uh, forget unicorns or sonicorns, anybody who's starting out, right, would have to touch e each of the dots at different points in time. So the refresher personally, I got was was fabulous. Uh, second, also one realized the 
how dots are connected. Very often we look at things in isolation, like an insurance regulator is sitting in Hyderabad. Uh, Mint Street has RBI, BKC has SEBI. You know, one realizes if something goes wrong, everybody comes after you. Yeah. It's it's not because everybody hates you. It's because you have done something which should not have or perceived should not have been done across different regulations. So the the how regula- regulators, and I'm not even going into tax and FEMA and PMLA. It's a different ball game altogether. So business increasingly in this space is not monoline. It cuts across regulators. They share a lot of information. Regulatory reputations are far more important than they were. There was a time you could get away with uh, not having a robust reputation with regulators. Today, your reputation is what will carry you through. No, I agree. And you, I th- what you said was really interesting because having been in banking, the fact of the matter is that you always had to deal with multiple regulators because you were distributing multiple types of products. Right. And given where fintech is and the fact that we're also doing similar activities, I do think that you know every fintech should follow that because eventually you are liable to answer to every single regulator if you're selling their products or you're distributing it in a certain manner. I think one of the questions I always had is that when you are, if you're just distributing, I think, you know, you are still like a fine line between distribution and manufacturing. But the fact of the matter is that fintechs are getting very close to being manufacturers themselves. So what you said was that while there's a wrapper concept, there's also fintechs now manufacturing almost banking products. So whether it's payments, for example, what we're doing with UPI, with a rail already available, whether a bank is actually creating a product on top of it or whether a fintech is, it's pretty much level playing field. Right. And uh, as long as we're able to get the, the same kind of treatment from a regulator, the product that we should have out there is competing with banks. So my question really to you is, from a standpoint of any fintech who's starting out, should they actually look at every single new product that they're manufacturing from a banking lens because eventually it is financial products that they're creating. So I think, you know, uh, the way fintechs have operated in this country has been, or, or startups worldwide have operated, it's not specific to this country, is it's easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Uh, but it's not worked very well because the regulator has not been forgiving. Uh, they've been punishing if, if at all uh, you violated things. So you're better off asking for permission than seeking punishment. So uh, my view is that, you know, wherever, I mean, there is uh, the reason why banks are slower than uh, than fintechs. One reason is because banks actually don't have coders. So banks are very poor at tech, if you ask me. Yeah. So that's where the tech, where fintech is better than banks. But banks are essentially also constrained by the enormous amount of regulation that's already standing and those regulations have been created over almost a hundred hundred and fifty years of financial services problems that have been seen and you know many a times at some point even regulators have gone back and removed certain regulations and realized that the problems come back in the form of very large global financial crisis also so yeah. regulations are standing because of certain challenges people have seen in the past and have drafted those regulations accordingly. So uh, a fintech entrepreneurs, when they're launching products, will have to pay cognizance to the existing regulations and make sure they're compliant. If they're not, eventually at a very small scale, the RBI might not notice you or the regulator might not notice you and you can get away. But if your scale becomes substantial, you will get caught. Or if the uh, persons who are transacting financially with you are at a loss, then they will report and obviously then you'll get caught earlier. But even if your product is benign and benefiting the customer, even then you could have a situation where if you are violating regulations and yet benefiting the customer, eventually you will get caught when your scale becomes big enough. The thing that I wanted to highlight is that not all regulations have been impediments or have slowed down. So they have also created enablers for for businesses. Take for example, now there is something called PACB, Payment Aggregator for Cross Border. It's created an opportunity for fintechs to get into a business which was not 
which was only available to banks till just recently or for that matter there is a product which IRDA has come up with surety bonds uh, now that's creating a new product which is available to uh, to for startups to access uh, providing guarantees synthetic guarantees under an insurance license so these are things which are enablers which were not there earlier and uh, I think not all regulation has been to try and curb startups, but also to encourage them. Thank you very much. I had a really, really good time uh, on this episode and I'm sure the viewers definitely understood a lot. Mm -hmm.